Steve Gilmore. This is the Gilmore Gang for Friday in April. Thanks so much. Uh, this is going to be an interesting show because uh, I, as always, refuse to discuss what we're going to discuss because I have no idea what we're going to talk about. Uh, so let me introduce the, my co-conspirators uh, in that effort. Um, from uh, God knows where, uh, but he's he was there last week uh, in the upper left-hand corner. It's Dan Farber. Welcome, Dan. Good afternoon, Steve and everyone else. I'm glad to be here to talk about nothing. Excellent. Uh, also from uh, the land of now is Keith Tier. What does that mean now? It means not then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, next, we have Danny Sullivan. Welcome, Danny. Thank you. Good to be here. Likewise. Uh, and uh, Kevin Marks. Welcome, Kevin. Hi there. Nice to see you all. And last but not least, certainly not least, uh, Samil Shaw. Hello. All right. So, since Scoble is uh, at Coachella, uh, yep. hopefully... <laughs> safe and sound under a pile of, uh, of body surfing. <laughs> it's an image, you know, what can I say? Uh, and, and not a good one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I try for the most benign uh, possible. Uh, he's usually who we throw it to for the zeitgeist about what's happening right now, t uh, tiny and shiny. So who's going to pick up the ball? So I'll start if you want. Okay. I think uh, Samil uh, will probably appreciate this, and if others don't, we can change the subject quickly. But I couldn't help but noticing Mark Zuckerberg's lengthy interview, I think it was in the New York Times this week, where he pontificated about the unbundling of the Big Blue app. And the, the, that coincided with news that Messenger was being closed down within the Big Blue app and was now only going to be available standalone. And today they've announced that the paper app has been updated with birthdays, events, photo comments, and group updates. So um, I'd made the point earlier that I thought Facebook was becoming more like a studio, an app studio, in the same way that there are game studios like Electronic Arts, and was taking, if you like, a portfolio approach to mobile. Uh, and should be praised for understanding that desktop is dying rapidly and they need to own mobile but are going to be very very challenged to be successful and and i think this last week they showed just how hard it's going to be to be successful because there isn't a whole lot of coherence in their announcements understanding the desktop interesting echo uh, <laughs> danny sullivan what do you think about uh what he just said um, you know, it, it makes sense, this sort of unbundling of things. Um, if you think about the way Google operates, you don't download a Google app, right? You download Gmail, you download Google+, Plus. they've got the Hangouts app that they want to have because Google really was never one single service that you used. It was a multiple bunch of different kinds of services. So, yeah, it makes a lot of sense that you would have... Facebook break up into all these different things. Um, I think the only danger is that there are some people who, you know, really want to have just a Facebook thing. And so, like, paper can be confusing to me because the paper app feels very much like the Facebook app. I mean, it's prettier and it's designed to do different things, but, you know, it, it it, it, it still feels like it's Facebook as opposed to the idea of them breaking out the messaging part of it, which, you know, is a, is a very different type of thing of just browsing what's happening on Facebook itself. Danny, what, what did you think? He made this point. He, he was asked, why did they acquire WhatsApp when they've got Messenger? And Messenger's doing about, apparently about 10 billion messages a day. And his answer was that there's a huge difference between text and chat. That, fa that WhatsApp really is part of the text world and, and, and Messenger is part of the chat world. Uh, do you buy that? Or do you think that's right? Or Yeah, no, I, I can totally see that. And I, I think that, 
and this is more personally, but I think we've had this sort of confusion where I still find people who seem to be confused about, for example, when they use uh, whatever it is on the iPhone, iMessage, where am I chatting with somebody or am I texting with somebody? Um, you know, the, the people who have turned to some of the texting apps especially seem to have done that because they want to text with someone in a... I'm going to send you a message, I'm going to get a message back, but we may not be necessarily having a constant stream of interactivity like we might do with a chat, and I don't want to pay the prices with it. So, you know, I can see it making sense to have those be out separately. I think it can sometimes get confusing if you try to try to blend the two together. Um, you know, especially when you're having to deal with people where the messages are going out based on a phone number rather than your your connection that's happening with them. So... That's an interesting point about the phone number and the role that plays and what kind of identifiers we have on mobile that people know us by. Mm. And different apps um, contain different ones. Like some people have got my phone number in an app, so other people have got email address in an app, other people have got some kind of a Twitter handle or something in an app. And it's pretty fragmented right now. And uh, obviously, as the guy who did real names, I'm always intrigued <laughs> by the possibility of pulling that together. Uh, into a real name. <laughs> well, and, and you can see that it makes sense too, and you can you can understand, for example, why Google wants to get rid of Google Voice and bring it into Hangouts, and that uh, ideally, if you want to contact someone, you don't want to have to think, oh, do I have a connection with them on Twitter, or is my connection with them on Facebook, or whatever it is? You know, you want to have this universal. I can get you connected this to this person because I understand all the different ways that you have connectivities to them. I, somebody uh, on our staff needed to reach somebody that's connected to me on LinkedIn and so they're like, do you have their email address? I'm like, oh, yeah, I, <laughs> apparently I do have their email address. But I had to know to go to LinkedIn to kind of look that up and it's not synced in with my contacts and I don't necessarily want it synced in with my contacts. So, yeah, potentially there's a, there's a big opportunity there. Um, you know, it, you you could think of it as a big opportunity on the messaging front, but perhaps the better opportunity is just on the contact front. Um, yeah. And I and I feel like to kind of cap off. I feel like it tends to be a mess too. You 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 deal with Facebook, and they're like, "Well, do you want us to download all your Facebook stuff?" And suddenly, I get like three thousand things shoved into my address book, and I don't want all that stuff there necessarily either. I kind of want some contacts that I've created to be real real contacts, if you will. So what about the idea that Facebook... Oh, hang on, hang on before we okay. get, uh, all right, all right. make this into the Keith Tier show. All right. Uh, uh, Samil, what do you think about... Uh, I'm the, just so happy to see Danny, Steve. That's what it is. I understand. Uh, <laughs> I'm barely containing myself as well. Uh, Samil, what yeah. is... Uh, do you buy the idea that, uh, uh, that this is going to uh, be a direction that somebody's going to be successful in, or... Uh, as I, who only watches my daughter for all tech information about what's happening and uh, about to happen, suggests that they don't care one whit about a unification of uh, of uh, user identity. That they're they're perfectly happy to use Snapchat for ugly stuff and uh, you know and just various things. So, since I've already answered my question, what do you think? I think. To answer that part of the question directly, and then I'll, I'll move to a higher level, is things may change over time. So um, people who use unbundled services or they get into the phone, at some point, a unified identity perhaps could enable them to build, identi build identity into a platform reputation, which could then turn into payments and make other things easier. And so that might be the way Zuckerberg is thinking about positioning it. I mean, he to his credit, did move the company over into mobile. Uh, you know, people open it around the country, around the world, multiple times a day. Even even though the app is pretty heavy, uh, he's lightened it up a bit. Um, just to build a little bit off of what uh, Steve, I'm sorry, Keith and Danny were saying. Um, one is I do think you know <laughs> Facebook is unbundled. Mobile is is unbundling Facebook. Uh, Zuckerberg, I think, deserves a lot of credit for recognizing this you know, and, and making moves. Whether he'll be able to get around that, and, and to your point, Steve, you know, grab people who are using Snapchat as their first entry point, that remains to be seen. And uh, Keith's point about there now being different 
graphs to mine, i.e. the address book, we're starting to see that now as well with the apps like What and Secret um, that basically just try to try to build a different identity graph around your mobile device. And I'm sure all the folks at Facebook are very aware of that. Uh, Dan Farber, you agree? Uh, yes, I think everybody's pretty spot on on this subject. And, and I've always talked about Facebook as being a company that is in the business of colonization, which is to say, you know, they want to cover the entire planet with their services. And I think Zuckerberg recognized that can't do that with Big Blue, and that uh, you needed to diversify and go and annex other parts of the internet, such as WhatsApp, where there's 450 million users who aren't necessarily performing that task um, within Facebook, you know, using Messenger. So all these moves to me are, are more of a company that's very much focused on being a huge presence and don't know where it ends up. Um, but I think one of the places they have to be thinking about it, I think as uh, Samil said, was it's about you know creating um, an Uber graph um, that can deliver what it needs to deliver no matter what context or application is you're using. A lot of this um, comes down to um, this issue of mobile identity. Uh, so a number of years ago, one of the early designers at Facebook, and she was a she was credit you know she was a designer of Quora. Her name was Rebecca Cox. She wrote a great essay about um, whoever wins mobile identity is going to win the next ten years. And her her thesis was sort of saying that like you know on the web Facebook has controlled our identity. On mobile, will another app or another operating system or Facebook come up and control what our identity is? Right now, it's wide open. Um, so I, I don't know what's going to control our identity. Um, and then the other vector you have, you know, which is way off on a tangent, but I'll just slip it in here, is will identity be decentralized with new systems coming on board and new protocols coming on board? Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll more pose the questions. I have no idea what the answers are. Feel free to weigh in, anybody. Kevin Marks. Well, so I think there's there's a couple of things going on here. I mean, um, I've I've been throwing links to the chat as as, as we go along, but um, there's um, the stuff that John Borthwick was talking about a while ago, where he was talking about different um, home screen icon share and what was there and what wasn't, um, and seeing that Google was gathering more and more share on the um, iPhone home screen from Apple because they've got a series of different very focused apps that do different things. Um, I mean, there is a Google app on, on iOS and on Android, but that's just a search. Um, but there's also Maps and uh, Hangouts and you know, a whole bunch of other Gmail and other things that are focused at particular tasks that Google has, has shipped out there. Apple has done a similar thing where they have a set of apps that, that do different pieces, whereas Facebook has just had the one app there and then they added Messenger and they've been gradually... You know, they have tried a bunch of others that have come and gone. They've also bought some and, and shut them down and consolidated them. But they're 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 looking you know they're looking at that one button to to do a particular task thing. But it's interesting watching Google in some respects do the opposite because Google is folding as 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 you said folding a lot of things down into Hangouts and saying we can unify the communication in that way. Um, and I think you know the a lot of this like couples with with Steve's thing about notifications being the actual routing here. Um, and if you get a notification that routes you into an app, and then it doesn't matter so much whether the app's on your home screen or not, if you're still getting notification, notifications from it and responding to them. So Messenger, Messenger does that. I think the other, the other thing that's, that's sort of interesting here is that by doing that, they're, they're taking the, um, the chat heads experience completely away from iOS. Because chat heads is something that works very well on Android because they can float the little heads over everything else. So if I get an incoming Facebook message, it will sit it will sit in front of everything else on the thing I can click on it and, and take it over. Um, so it's got a parallel notification stream there with, with the little face on the side um, and, a, and a quick switch mechanism. Whereas on iOS they don't have that unless you're already inside Facebook. So there's a, uh, um, there's a sort of structural affordance problem there with which, which one you're trying to do. Um, the other thing that, that's in this that, that fits with the identity stuff is the, is the stuff that um, I think I mentioned a couple of weeks ago that Tantec was doing, looking at different ways of um, 
trying to model the communications with people in a way that's like the app screen. Um, I put a link in the chat to that. But basically, his 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 thinking was that um, he, in a way, of, in in the way of expressing your identity of like, here's how to contact me. The 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 most clear way to express that to people is a series of icons that represent the apps that that. You, um, you can use, then they can look at that and say, oh, he uses these five apps, I like using that one and click that one to, to contact him. So I think that that model of explaining the interaction through a set of app icons makes some sense. Um, and that is undermined a little by Google pulling everything into Hangouts because it's less clear that clicking the, the Hangouts thing, what it means. It used to mean I want to um, you know, send you a, a, a G-chat, but as it's eaten SMS and it's eaten video chat as well, it's, it's less clear what clicking that icon will do. So, my, uh, Steve, if I'm allowed, uh, um, my, 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 um, my problem with some of that, and I maybe, maybe I misunderstand it, Kevin, but my problem with some of that is that from a normal user point of view, routing things to various apps is just too clunky and geeky and probably not very transparent. You'd have to at least go through multiple OAuths to validate everything. Why not make everything user-centric? Why not make the user the center and make some of these things services that apps can consume so that the, the service becomes the horizontal layer and the apps just plug into it, rather than having to figure out how to route things into various apps? Well, the problem with that The idea. app is the modality that people are thinking about. They're thinking, is this a chat? I should be using the chat. Is, is this a Facebook-like chat? This is things like we're saying. Is this a Facebook-like chat? Is this an SMS-like chat? Is this a Snapchat-like thing where I'm sending an image to a set of people? Um, is this an Instagram-like thing where I'm sending an image to an undefined set of people that's more public? Um, is it a Facebook-type thing where I'm sending an image to... Um, you know anyone who might know me that that roots on Facebook. So people already use the app as the um, the categorization of the class of sharing that they're doing, um, and I think the they're used to that thinking about them as different communication modalities. So what I was going to say is that uh, to reinforce what Kevin just said, uh, the app is the center of the universe. Everything else is, uh, at least to my 13-year-old, irrelevant. She couldn't care less about individual apps. She sees them as cooperating screens or features in the larger app, which is called her, you know, computing environment. That is the app. Uh, and fundamentally, you know, the, when Keith, when you say, uh, you know, having to go through some sort of uh, multiple uh, OAuth or you know scenario to to log in. Once you're in, you're in. You just switch back and forth, and notifications gives you a vehicle for doing that. If something occurs in the notification layer, you click on it, and if you if the app's already loaded as it is in both iOS and Android, you go to the screen that you were last at. <coughs> Yeah, I get that. I get that. But I tend to think that it won't be very long before mm. both Android and iOS start to support a lot of these sharing paradigms natively. It, a little bit like Windows sucked things into the OS over time as they became essential. And I'm not convinced that apps are on solid ground for some of these behaviors. Uh, other, others probably will always be in apps, like the Whisper type stuff. Well, I I'm, I don't agree with you, but uh, Samil, what do you think? Do you think that uh, apps are uh, are already dead man walking? No, I mean I think there's probably a happy medium somewhere. I think right now and for the foreseeable future, uh, you know, people are voting with their fingertips, right? They love apps, uh, so that that's pretty clear. I think if you think about deep linking and what could happen between Google and what they know and how Android is developing, there's a possibility there as well. Um, one other point I wanted to make, going back to kind of Facebook and Zuckerberg, uh, just to play devil's advocate too, you know, yes, Facebook is being threatened by mobile. A lot of companies are threatened by mobile. Um, the, the other argument could be that, look, all these new apps that come in, like your daughter that you're referencing who, you know, she lives in an app-centric world, uh, she doesn't care about these other services. She just goes in and goes out as she pleases. There's this kind of disposability 
in the of apps and the mindset of consumers, and that what's great today could not be great tomorrow. And it makes it great for developers who who want to write new applications and kind of do it from scratch and put things out there in the world. It makes it difficult, like we've talked about in previous episodes, from an investment perspective. And that sort of era of disposability of apps, of the ease of writing them, the ease of distributing the good ones, could, in a roundabout way, actually provide a cushion to Zuckerberg. Uh, I agree with that. Uh, Danny Sullivan, do you agree with that? On on our app? A, the a app. cushion uh, for Zuckerberg. <sighs> You weren't listening, were you? No, no, no. It's 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 a cushion to what? A cushion to Facebook not being Facebook's future? People not using the Facebook app or where? I mean, Meaning to me, like, the biggest challenge Facebook really seems to face is what happens if people just get tired of Facebook, right? You know, I I was going on Facebook, I was sharing all this stuff, but now the next big thing comes along, and do I want to move off into that direction? There's lots of other things you can do with Facebook, but. That seems to be their challenge, right? That that, that seems to be the, the the big fear that they would tend to have, and you know I don't know that having a, a plethora of different apps solves that. Maybe it does. Certainly, the idea that you know Facebook may say, right, we're going to build up our messaging activity portions of things, um, you know, so that we're going to make that more of a solidification. That that can make a lot of sense. You you could see that Facebook potentially could roll out just the photos part of what they do, right? I mean, you could have a Flickr-like app that is really just designed to give you Facebook photos and let you share all your Facebook photo stuff and have that separately. And, and maybe you're building up people who make use of that who, who aren't necessarily thinking I'm using Facebook, but are thinking I'm using the whole Facebook photo type of stuff. And so, you know, in that regard, yeah, I suppose it would give them a cushion. But to me, the cushion really is a cushion against the next big thing. You know, if there is going to be that kind of a next big thing, if that makes sense. Right, and I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with that. I think there's two types of audiences. There's, you know, we should segment them. There's this large audience that already is tied into Facebook Web. Let's say it has Facebook on their phone, and now they're starting to divert to the Instagrams and these other things. Then there's this whole other audience that's just coming online. Their first computers are mobile phones, and they're using like like Steve has referenced, uh, you know, someone in his family, just using Snapchat, Instagram, these other services. So, what, my only argument was for that second audience is that the amount of apps and the disposability of them and the mindset of the consumer, meaning I can I can just move on from Snapchat to the next thing if I want to, and that kind of competition um, could indirectly and in a weird way. Um, both, you know, create this cushion for Facebook that, you know, at some point you end up going to Facebook because it offers you this, this network. Mm -hmm. And is that good for uh, investment or bad for investment? A cushion for Facebook. Well, I, I think you'll see, and and through this little correction we're seeing in the market, the uh, Wall Street certainly likes Facebook being led by Mark Zuckerberg. Mm -hmm. right now. <clears throat> That's not in question. That's not to say it won't change over the next few years. In terms of early stage investment into apps, I sort of sort of beat this drum, but there's a few categories in which this really works. Uh, and other categories, most of the smart early stage money has said, hey, I'm going to sit back. I'm going to wait and see what breaks out. I'm not going to try to predict consumer behavior and pay up to get into those companies. Dan Farber. Well, uh you know, the, Facebook is thinking way beyond today. They're thinking about the next two or three billion people they want to bring into their orbit. And that doesn't mean that every that orbit is, is what they have today. So I think that as they're trying to broaden the market for applications and for what they do, especially in emerging markets, you know, they have got to really think hard about what are the kinds of apps and services that they can build, acquire, partner with to you know, get that continued growth. Because without that continued growth, it kind of falls on itself. Well, the, their continued growth is not necessarily determined by br bringing on all, all these people. I mean, the, the billions and billions of people, yes, <clears throat> increase advertising growth, but there's 
other things Facebook could do grew less if it grew at a slightly slower pace relative to what you're suggesting and sort of moved more into tying identity and commerce together. So the example that I use um, a lot is would would a thousand people, if they were given their Facebook profile, upload their credit card to that profile so that when they're buying a ticket to fly in Virgin America, they just click, you know, Facebook payment or something like that. And I know they tried this before. Um, that I think a lot of people would do that, and it would remove a lot of friction around payments. It would remove a lot of friction around uh, verifying identity. And so there are these adjacent things that Facebook could do. Now, it is a separate question whether they will be able to execute against that. No, I, I agree. You know, they can certainly mine their current user base um, and get their, you know, their ARPU, their revenue per customer up. Um, but I also think they have this grand ambition. I think Zuckerberg has this ambition to, you know, be able to say that Facebook serves three, four billion people. Yes. And that the pursuit of that, you know, could become a problem for them if it distracts them from what you've been talking about, which is you know, delivering the core services that keep keep the billion people they have now uh, coming back from or and keeping their attrition rate low. Oh, that's an interesting frame. I mean, that actually reminds me of some of the conversations we've had here about uh, about Twitter. And so it's interesting that it's coming back. You know, the um, how how are they going to keep the you know current users uh, in the in the search for growth? Well, and I think the way they're trying to do that is is figure out ways to serve them the same things in a different way, which is you know the unbundling of the apps or acquiring new things. Um, but uh, the the picture you painted of them becoming basically your identity that allows you to do uh, transactions and commerce uh, that's very powerful. So, so to me, the the key is to distinguish between. Um, users and engaged users and, and I think what's happening that's driving the unbundling is that the number of engaged users in the big blue app is I don't know if it's growing more slowly or, or even declining if, if you measure it by engagement and the number of engagements in Instagram and WhatsApp um, are growing and uh, in fact it was announced I think this week that Instagram surpassed Facebook in terms of engagement um, for the first time. So um, Facebook's all about engaged users, but then it's having to dilute its brand in order to buy that engagement. It's keeping WhatsApp as WhatsApp, Instagram as Instagram, and who knows what else in the future. And and it doesn't really have any horizontal services in the same way, say, Google does with, that, with AdSense or AdWords that, that works across that. For example, you know, an Instagram user who wants to chat with another Instagram user almost always shares a kick handle or some other handle to uh, allow that person to go off, open another app, and then engage with the same user in chat off of Instagram. And, and um, that's an example of how fragmented the platform is now, how hard it is to monetize engagement that happens outside of the core apps. And, uh, I've got to believe that's a major concern for them going forward, and they must be focused on horizontal monetization, at least, if not horizontal services like like chat. I would uh, I would underscore um, Keith's point, which is a lot of the revenue, um, a lot of the revenue that Facebook has been booking and the street has been very receptive to, has been exploiting this um, problem on mobile app distribution where you have. A lot of people with a lot of deep pockets slash venture capital looking to use Facebook as this acquisition channel. That will dry up over time um, for a number of reasons. The, the other side of the coin is just this idea of what you can do with Instagram, which I think um, the public at large sort of underestimates the sheer power and potential influence and money-making capability of this app. Um, I I tend to think it could be huge and actually could be the fe feature like core core future of Facebook. Um, it just has massive massive potential, and because it's been subsumed 
uh, in, in sort of Dan's colonization framework, uh, which I, I think is a great framework, um, we, we sort of sometimes forget about the, the scale, the potential scale of it. Okay. okay. Dan? Dan? Um, well, I think we're talking about scale, and Facebook is a company that values scale in everything, scale in its data center, scale in the number of users, scale in the number of apps, scale in the ways it can touch people, and especially scale in the time spent on its services um, and how it monetizes that. So we're, we're, you know, we're looking at you know, one of these companies that has very big ambitions and lots of money in the pot and some and I think from what we've seen over the last 10 years, the company's been exist in existence is some very smart people who um, are not afraid to disrupt themselves, not afraid to take apart the, the blue website and trade it differently in, in a mobile context. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because you see these little <clears throat> companies who can start up and get hundreds of millions of users with... 20 employees and a little bit of uh, funding and you never know what kind of leadership they have that could you know do what Zuckerberg has done so it's uh, you know it's a, it's kind of like what we like to cover which is the you know who's winning and who's losing what's the score and that's pretty much what drives the creativity I'm hearing a little bit of uh, uh, noise around uh, somebody's earphones. It might be yours, Dan. Yeah. <coughs> Just pardon the expression, let it hang loose. Yes, so there you are. Okay, much better. Uh, Danny Sullivan, what, what's your... Uh, are we talking too much about Facebook and not enough about something that's more important? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's been lots of stuff going on in the news. Um I mean, are you wanting to change the topic or? <laughs> I don't know why people don't seem to understand that if they open their mouths and say something, uh, I'm not going to stop them. I can't. No, no, it's it's fine. It's interesting. I mean, it, I, I especially liked what Dan was saying about the whole idea of not being afraid of taking apart the part, uh, taking apart the site and putting it into the mobile stuff. But. Um, you know, I think that was interesting. Yeah, I'm not so implying that anything that you guys have said is not interesting. It is. I'm just trying to, uh, you know, I just think worrying about what Mark Zuckerberg needs to do for himself is not high on my list of priorities. I got, I got some stuff for you. Okay. Um, I think we're seeing, with, well, Airbnb, um, as emblematic of other companies, they just announced that they closed. <laughs> Pretty big round, um, valuing the company at about ten billion. Um, sorry, about a tenth of what? Sorry, a ten billion dollars. Uh, -huh. uh, and so you know, they they have potential to be a huge company. Um, the interesting thing about that is that the a lot of the articles that I read about it um, were putting the comps at around what the what the main hotel chains are at. Um, the other thing is just underneath that is the amount of large private uh, money coming into these later private companies so the, the these premium companies are staying private longer and longer not entering the public markets and um, you know that could have consequences down the road good or bad ones it I guess that hinges on how secular a shift a money manager thinks that we are in um, Somebody could make the argument very credibly on, on Airbnb to say, look, the potential is there, it's huge. But in a short-term hold, whether I think Airbnb will go out in the next couple of years, they could get battered on the street um, because investors get skittish about something in their model. If I'm a long-term holder, I could just say, I want to buy in at this price. I think that they could be a 50 to $100 billion company and own all hotel listings, all own space listings. Any, any kind of any kind of marketplace like that and rival uh, eBay, uh, it just depends on your frame of view. I I tend to think uh, that some of the some of the big companies that are getting big valuations are part of the secular trend, like we talked about Dropbox last week. Um, and even though while I'm a fan of Airbnb, I do tend to think there's a lot of nuance in uh, 
um, you know, regulation in dealing with landlords, then paying city taxes that need to be worked out that I don't think will be worked out in the next year or two, three years, uh, partly because these are emotional issues. And Dropbox, uh, just using them as a proxy, is less of an emotional issue. It's just where's my stuff and what can I do on top of it. So I, I, I would agree with you, and I, I use slightly different words to describe how I understand it, but to me it's the, um, uh, the abandonment of true risk-taking by later stage investors. They're, they're going for growth. Now you're arguing that it is still quite risky, and I think it is still quite risky, but what they're betting on is that 10 billion can become 100 billion in the same way that Kleiner Perkins did with Twitter when they, I think it was a four billion valuation when they invested and everyone said they're nuts but they got a huge upside to that. So to me that represents, I'm putting in, in the negative, the abandonment of risk. That What I really mean is the abandonment of venture capital and its replacement by growth capital. And at the same time at the other end I had a big, not a big fight, but I had a fight this week with uh, um, Nivi, not Nivi, uh, Naval and um, Mark Andreessen on Twitter, when uh, Naval tweeted, you can build a startup for $5,000 these days. And I said, that's bullshit, unless you don't have to pay anyone. Because even one person will cost you at least that a month if you have to pay anyone, probably double that. And uh, uh, Andreessen came in and said, no, we just in invested in Imja. Um, and they'd only raise seven dollars, not seven thousand dollars even, seven dollars today. So then I, I tweeted back, you know, the, the, the uh, outside examples don't make your case. Um, people still cost, you know, somewhere, if they're engineers, between 100k and 150k a year. So if you are trying to teach the world you can build a startup for 5k, you're trying to teach them not to pay anyone. I, I, think, I think maybe something got lost in the semantics there. My guess is what Naval was saying, and you you do see some examples of this around the world, which is a single person can take, or two people not paying themselves can take a couple of grand and handle some build a product themselves, handle something at scale. That that's kind of what he's saying. I think to build a company and to build a business, um, Keith, you're right. It requires probably more money. Um, especially in a mobile environment, than than the than investors are willing to dole out. It just also depends. I mean, the Instagram is a classic case. I mean, I think Snapchat, if they pull off what they can pull off, could be a highly leveraged company with less than 100 people. Uh, Stripe is well under 100 people. A tremendous amount of leverage inside Stripe if they pull off um, what the what the potential is for there. So I I think Naval and other people who who make this are more about just like sort of how do you get out of the gate? How can you start making money? How can you start getting growth? And um, the, the implication there is that you're not paying yourself. You have some server costs, you have some equipment costs, and then go from there. Yeah, and the, but the big one is you're not paying yourself. And anyway, to your point earlier, there's a lot of obsession at the early stage with incubation because it's so cheap. Even though I think they're wrong, they're not wrong in general that it's cheaper uh, at the early stage. Um, although it's not necessarily as lean as it used to be in Web 2.0 because we now have to develop for Android, iOS, and, and probably the web. Um, and uh, at the high end, you know, there's a ton of money going to growth. But uh, that, those two things have always been true in every country in the world. In London, when I lived in London, you could get a little bit of money at the beginning, and if you were successful, you could get a lot of money. What used to be different about Silicon Valley is that you could fund the, let's say, up to 20 people in the period before you've got traction required to pull off the big idea. Now it's very hard to do that. But, but I can explain why that is. So if we separate out uh, B2C, straight consumer, and, and sort of, let's say, uh, B2B, selling to businesses or, or building infrastructure, on the B2B side and the infrastructure side, you still see these $10 million Series A's with a couple of really smart guys, a slide deck, and a twist on the technology that only they can build. Those, those folks are getting the money. That, the money is there to do that if they have the right approach and they have the right connections. On the consumer side, I think what the market is saying is, look, a lot of young folks who are very talented, 
who don't want to maybe go work at Facebook, they don't want to work at Apple, they can enter into these little experiments. And you, the experiments are you build stuff. It's that hackathon accelerator model. And if something hits, then let's start talking about funding the company. Yep. And, and so what the, what the entrepreneurs, in the sense, they're entering into this, let's say, American Idol at scale experiment where they're sitting around and building products, seeing what sticks, and investors are saying, look, when you go consumer with these kind of products, I don't want to invest until I see something. And this is why, even for seed stage capital, meaning to get one to two million, whether you want to call it the new baby A or, or a seed round or whatever, um, they want to see six months of 20 to 30 percent month on month growth. They want to see day two retention metrics, day 30 retention metrics, right? And, yeah, so, but at the same time, they want, to, they want you to do it for $5,000. And honestly, there's a, there's a huge disconnect there between the desire for traction and the lack of ability to fund the early stage. And it usually takes between a year and 18 months. But is this really something that's different uh, than it's ever been? I mean, you know, the people that can afford to be innovative in, in the consumer space are the ones that are either really young and can afford to, you know, you know, eat Twinkies for a, a year or two, or they've got a lot of money and they can afford to throw, uh, you know, money at n numerous targets and see which one sticks. I mean, is this is this fundamentally a different uh, thing that's happened, and if so, why? I think it is it is different, and I, and I think I know the reason why is is more than a single thing. It isn't simple, but it's about the last five years, and um, the major impacts were number one, um, the DST Capital guy coming in and investing in Facebook led to VCs realizing that there was money to be made late stage in growth investing. And with the rise of incubators, that there was too much competition and too, and, 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 uh, you know, and they didn't really justify putting in small amounts of money into a lot of startups the way that incubators do. So the VCs kind of abandoned the early stage and moved towards the late stage, uh, driven by LP conservatism in the aftermath of the bubble bursting where the LPs want the VCs to be making, you know, winning decisions uh, and, and risk, therefore. But that's but that's a cyclical, cyclical issue uh, in the venture community. No, uh, it is. It's always boom or bust, and when it's bust, uh, you know, s somehow innovation keeps occurring. I, I think Keith is right in, in, in the assessment he just gave, and I think what he was talking about there was the traditional, traditional venture capital that, um, most people were accustomed to for a while, and then in that shift, you know, sort of new forms emerged. But I mean, I think we should just we, we should focus on the original point, which is for for direct to consumer software products, whether it's a website, whether it's a mobile app, whether it's a wearable or something like this, um, that maybe requires more money. M most most investors, unless you meet somebody who who is an outlier, who has a, a skill or a background or a set of people that somebody wants to make a bet on, they they would rather just wait. And that yeah. even happens in the early stages. And so what that means for a founder, for an entrepreneur, is that they have to be comfortable with that, you know, the roller coaster is a little bit different. Maybe in the past a roller coaster had big undulating waves that expanded over time. Now it's compressed. And so if you're comfortable entering into that environment, you'll do well because you'll understand that in this era of disposable apps and things being written and distributed very quickly that you can't predict. Now, yeah. the counter argument to this is what in some investors and entrepreneurs have done is this lab slash studio approach. Um, and so I would never count anybody out and there are a lot of smart people doing it. Um, that's another way investors have sort of tried to jam in here and to say, okay, I want to I want to invest into this network and they're going to create, you know, five to ten apps per year and maybe I'll reduce my beta there um, and try to, you know, try to do that. And it's sort of like how VCs used to do EIR programs. And Dan Farber, Dan Farber, uh, uh, someone in the chat room is complaining that uh, John Toshek is uh, not here, so we're missing his uh, enterprise perspective. 
Uh, can you give us some enterprise perspective, please? Enterprise perspective. Yeah, I, I mean, we're talking about uh, you know the internals of the uh, venture community and obviously consumer uh, uh, you know investment is a significant part of that. But there seems to be a lot going on. If you look at what happened with Box last week and uh, or Dropbox last week and Box is an ongoing story about uh, uh, what's going on in the enterprise space. Do you see any kind of um, can you give any kind of perspective about what the impact of whatever these changes are that uh, uh, that Keith and Samil are talking about, whether that's having an impact in the enterprise? Well, you know, they're more expert in that area uh, in terms of the investment community, but it, it seems pretty clear that that there uh, there's a lot of money that have, that has gone into those kinds of companies. Um, you talk about Uber getting. Um, or Airbnb getting 450 million in investment. Well, um, you know that that's a pretty mature company at this point. And I think that for the enterprise companies, you see uh, a lot of investment going in in later stages because people are can see results coming. It's not such a uh, a shot in the dark uh, with many of those companies. So whether it's Dropbox or Box, um, and I'm sure you can name many others. Especially those living off of ecosystems that, you know, Oracle, SAP, Salesforce, and others have, uh, that there's tremendous opportunity because that's a more knowable space. Uh, you can see it's addressing a need where people know kind of how it plays out to some degree, and it's just a matter of, you know, can you compete, can you execute, as opposed to let's bring something new to the market uh, and see if it sticks. You're nodding, Samil. Yeah, so a couple of things, um, what I see from my perch around enterprise or sort of learned over the years. One, um, it took me a while to realize this one, which is um, while enterprise, I think, will always be funded and always have a good funding environment for Silicon Valley, uh, and people will revert back to it when they get skittish about consumer and I'll go back and forth, um, that the valuations, at least in the beginning, will always be more tempered um, because the end market is is actually lower than what it would be for a breakout consumer hit. And so the FOMO that drives a lot of stuff on the consumer side doesn't really happen on the enterprise side. Now when you look in, inside the silo of enterprise and you start chopping that up, you know, you have areas like SaaS which don't require a lot of money to start, but then acquire, you know, require a lot of money for sales. You have areas like infrastructure where you need um, very, very accomplished technical people who have a knowledge of something secret uh, to go attack something and those those folks need five, ten million just to start and start recruiting the best people. <clears throat> then you have companies that are you know sort of more offering this cloud first or cloud native model. So what I'm seeing um, and I, I look at some of these early stage deals, they're actually priced less than um, most of the consumer things I see, the founders are ex extremely more technical, have much more of an impressive background just on paper, um, and but they're entering into a slightly more defined market where they have to try to take market share from other people. And you know, once you get too big, you either get crushed or acquired. So that's what I see happening in enterprise, and I I still think you'll always see classic Silicon Valley investors investing in enterprise. Now caveat would be, even though I've done a few seed investments in the enterprise space and I'm, I'm by no means any expert, I'd love to learn more, I don't see a lot of other people like me and that could be because I haven't met them yet or maybe there's not that many of them there. So I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out. Uh, Danny Sullivan, you have you've been quiet. Uh, is this just outside your area of interest, or do you have something to say? I uh, well, you have to unmute if that's what you've been doing. I'm silent because I was on mute. I've been trying to talk this whole time. You guys <laughs> hardly let me in. No, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> the VC stuff I don't get into. So, um, and anything I had to say is so jaded and annoying that is jaded and annoying. <laughs> Okay, but what about, uh, I mean, uh, what I was going to say about the enterprises is that uh, although people seem 
starting with Mike Arrington, seem to think that it's about you know it's carburetors instead of Ferraris. Uh, the the reality is is that uh, all of the big enterprise uh, players that have emerged, particularly in the cloud era, have been drafting off of the consumerization uh, of uh, you know apps, etc. There's a, a huge rewriting of the infrastructure of the enterprise on apps mm. in the mobile space, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there. Are, it uh, it doesn't have to be about an enterprise company to understand that uh, that you know that these technologies that we're all interested in are are laced through the enterprise as a result of this pass along, and also the fact that you know consumers, uh, you know, in order to be consumers, they have to have jobs. In order to have jobs, they have to use these tools in the enterprise uh, in order to. Uh, be able to move the needle. So uh, I saw an article that, uh, well, I don't know if you wrote about this, but there seems to be some discussion about the merging of uh, web and app signals in in Google's latest uh, uh, dashboard. Uh, Does that uh, signal any kind of interest um, in taking this data and moving it into an enterprise context, and I would say the same thing. Ask the same thing about uh, Twitter's move to uh, acquire uh, Gnip uh, last week. I I don't think it's that they're trying to do something enterprise wise. I mean, one of the unifying things that a lot of the startups that have gotten attention isn't that they were enterprise or consumer oriented, but that ultimately they were um, making their money because somebody was selling ads off of them. I mean, you know, it's it, you. You look at a lot of these things, especially the things that were really big valued recently, right? And what was the consumer paying for Instagram that made it worth the one billion dollars? Nothing. What were they paying for what app? A dollar forever or a dollar a year? I mean, there was no no real consumer revenue that justified how much money was spent to acquire that sort of thing. Um, you know, any number of acquisitions you can look at there. Consumers were not spending money on these sorts of things. They were valued and purchased also not because there was some great enterprise activity that was seen to be associated with them, but because someone thought, well, ultimately, these are eyeballs. There's a big number of consumers using this stuff, and so we'll throw some ads at them down. Are they there, eyeballs? Regardless of whatever any founder wants to say about, we'll never violate your privacy, or we'll never show you any ads, or blah, 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 blah. You know, that's so when you ask about what's Google doing in terms of how they're trying to give you a better sense of what's happening on apps and mobile and combining that with the web, that's because one of the problems Google has and which came out of their most recent revenues is that, you know, they want to sell these ads out there. They want these ads to be as valuable whether or not they're in an app or they're on the web, you know, and so they need to be able to give advertisers a common set of metrics so they can say, right, this person that you tried to reach out on the web later on downloaded your app and has been using your app and is therefore this valuable to you so now you can cough up even more money to get more people um, and advertise with us because then we can have the money to pay for all the auto driving cars and air drone companies that we just purchased okay so what what about the uh, the Twitter uh, uh, bringing back into the fold the uh, I think there are three or four maximum uh, uh, people, firehose companies consumers. that have firehose uh, access. Well, w- what's the significance of that? To to bring in the, you mean to get the GNIP was basically you mean to pull uh, it all back. Or? They were pushing uh, people who were trying to get access to subsets of that data. They were pushing them to GNIP basically as a third party, you know, sort of a middleman. Well, my understanding uh, was GNIP was purchased them. because that was going to allow them to do more um, direct app integration as part of Twitter, and not necessarily the, the Firehose stuff seemed to be sort of a a secondary thing. But maybe somebody can clarify more about that. Kevin, do you agree me. with that? Sure. I mean, obviously, Twitter has the Firehose themselves, so buying access to the Firehose doesn't make sense. But I think what they're what they're getting there is people who've got some experience with constructing products there and building things that they've they're already able to sell. Um, I was just thinking about this. So, so there's there's Ganip, there's Data Sift, there's Radian Six. Who else has got access to the Firehose? Uh, Microsoft for, with Bing, um, not Google anymore. Um, it, it, is there anyone else who's actually bought bought up, signed up for that? Well, that's why I said three or four. 
So you just named four. Right. Somebody said it's already. But, but on. you know, them bringing that well, back Topsy, in house. Well, Topsy, one of the things that Gnip did and Datasift does Apple, is that they so, crawl more than just Twitter. They'll give you a you feed know. that that crawls um, parts of Facebook and blogs and a bunch of other sources too. And the question is whether Gnip will st will still be doing that or whether they'll just focus on doing Twitter analytics. And and maybe they you know, this is part of Twitter's more uh, media focused stuff and trying to bring tools for for media um, companies to um, use Twitter mm. more. That 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 was my, my, that was slightly my sense of what, what they might be looking at with this. Dan Farber, what do you think that uh, the Gnip acquisition is about? I think it's more about them having more products to sell, and, you know, selling basically business intelligence on on what's going on on Twitter. Business intelligence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's called an enterprise app. Thank no, you. That's called. Oh. I'm going to sell you advertising. I mean, it's not. It, it is an enterprise app, but ultimately it comes back to Twitter needs to make sure that they have the right things that they can put in front. The reason Google has Google Analytics and gives it away for free isn't because they think people should be able to just automatically go through and analyze what's going on, on their websites. They want people to advertise on Google. And the way you convince people to advertise on Google is to say when you advertise on Google, you're going to get a good return on your investment. And you can track that because we'll give you these analytics tools that for whatever reason you haven't purchased or decided that you don't want to purchase. So we'll give it to you for free. So what Twitter needs to do is build up its own suite of analytics tools so that people can go to Twitter directly and better understand what on earth people are doing at Twitter, especially when it comes under fire that people question whether or not Twitter has any value. And what was really, really interesting was actually when they acquired Second Screen, which was about a month or so ago. And that, the reason that was interesting is because Second Screen had been the bestest of buddies with all the data that Facebook was using to try to analyze and show that actually Facebook is the second screen where everybody's going on and when there's a TV show they're all Facebooking about it not tweeting about it so come on television advertisers you need to spend all your money over here with us not with Twitter because we really have it all happening here at Facebook so Twitter acquires second screen and suddenly guess what you're not going to be seeing Facebook being able to use that data anymore to go back to the television advertisers and say hey uh, it'll all be back to Twitter again so this is, I, this is a new uh, strategy that we're seeing a lot of. It's not aqua hire, it's aqua fire. You fire the, your competitor's access to a, a service by buying it. Well, I, they, they haven't yet turned off the other guys, like Datacept. If, if they were to do that, then it would be a clear signal that they want to turn the data part of their business into a business. And some people have estimated it's already $100 million a year of revenues based on selling access to data. I, it seems a bit high to me, but um, if they switch the other guys off, then that's what it's about. If they don't, then it's what Kevin said, which is mainly talent acquisition for new suites of products that speak to data services. More broadly though, I, I, I wouldn't necessarily assign any coherence to what Dick is having to do at Twitter. He He's working on multiple fronts to not you know, get dinged next time he does an earnings call, as he did the last time. And he's got to do what I think of as um, slightly unnatural acts. That is to say, do things that drive revenue that wouldn't necessarily be organic to their roadmap if, if revenue was not a consideration. And, and um, I think you're going to see them do a whole bunch of stuff, which when you add it all together, it, the only common denominator is there might be more revenue in this rather than a product sensibilities or product thinking. Samil? Yeah, I mean, I guess if we're talking about Twitter, I would, I would agree uh, with, with what folks are saying. You have to, you know, to thread together what, what Danny and Keith are saying is that beyond advertising, what else can the company do to strengthen its foundation when it's coming up on a critical uh, point? The only other point I would make, which is a little bit semantic, is I, you know, one around consumerization of enterprise. I think there that gets sort of thrown around a lot and is a little bit misunderstood. There's really two ways. There's this Dropbox model of you grab the consumer first at home and they will infiltrate their work uh, because they love the product. The second piece would be more around like a a traditional SaaS product that's built right for a business or for an enterprise business where they use consumer-like techniques and design um, to to win business. Uh, so anyway, that's the only point I, w I was going to make. 
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're just having a debate here uh, about whether we're going to call the show slightly unnatural acts or just unnatural acts. Or Scoble at Coachella. <laughs> now, that'll be a headline. <laughs> uh, I was wa- reading some art. Oh, yeah, about Aaron Levy. A really interesting article uh, about the uh, box CEO. And uh, there's a picture of him. And I look at the, at the picture credit. Of course, it's Scoble. You, you, you can't get rid of him no matter how far away he goes you know one one thing i was thinking about steve and like having been on the show a couple times and i find that i learn a lot you know in the conversation like after it sort of seeps in one thing i did notice is we end up talking a lot about the bigger companies what's facebook up to what's twitter up to um, and they're clearly very influential i wonder if folks are interested in what's kind of bubbling up um, that maybe has nothing to do with Twitter, nothing to do with Facebook. Um, well, if you're looking for permission, I refer you to about 10 minutes ago when I pointed out that when you say something, uh, yeah. it, it goes out on the network. So knock yourself out. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm looking at things that are very, very narrow, um, you know, to start. So seeing a lot of vertical consumer-to-consumer um, marketplaces on mobile. Uh, mm-hmm. Seeing a lot of hard connected hardware, um, trying to learn trying to learn that space. Um, seeing a lot of things in Bitcoin, trying to learn that. I'm just curious what like the crowd here is interested in. Um, you know, stuff maybe that won't reach Facebook or Twitter scale, but that people are. You know, I, I tend to look where where I see very smart people and engineers and designers noodling on, and that's where I see them gravitating to. So just on that note, Samil, uh, we, we just, um, uh, we being Archimedes Labs, we, we, one of our companies was announced last week. It's called Downtown. And it's a couple of German guys um, and a Spanish guy. And, um, you know, it's kind of audacious for three guys, but their pitch is um, uh, bringing downtown home is their subtext. And what they're talking about is how irrational it is that Amazon dominates e-commerce because the high street is already warehouse and you can already get something today but nobody's done the work to make the high street be deliverable uh, in your house right now uh, you know in london when i used to live in london there was motorcycle couriers everywhere and if a new graphics card came out one day i would get on the phone buy it from the store and pay a motorcycle courier to go and pick it up and bring it to me and um, it was really expensive i mean it was not rational to do that and these days, I probably would wait one day and get it from Amazon tomorrow or the day after with Prime. But if there was a company like this downtown that really could curate downtown and make a great app that let me buy stuff and get it today without any extra cost, I would totally do it. It would be better than Amazon. I think that you, uh, what, what you're sharing about your colleagues in downtown raises uh, two, two interesting angles for me. One is the intense, intense level of competition and money going into these same-day or short-mile delivery services, um, which is, it, it could fill up an entire <laughs> Morgan show. Um, you know, so I'll just leave, put that out there and, and leave it there. The second thing is more just the social uh, ramifications of, when, when you said the word downtown, downtown's an emotional word. Yeah. Uh, and... When when people like like a lot of the coffee shops went away, um, you know, when, when people don't have those local neighborhoods or local shops, how does that change a place like London or neighborhoods that you know you're you used to come from? Um, and that's something I think about a lot too. Um, don't have any answers, but it's very very interesting. I mean, are we gonna is is an Amazon warehouse gonna be our new downtown? You know, physically our downtown. Um, I don't know. <coughs> uh, my 13 yeah. year old story is that uh, 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 Ella was uh, complaining that something hadn't arrived uh, and she went to the door to see if it was there and it wasn't. And, and this is 9 o'clock at night. Two minutes later. No, no, no. It was, it was 10 minutes till 10. 10 minutes till 10, sorry. Two minutes later. Uh, the dogs go berserk, and you know, of course, we don't never believe that uh, they actually know something that we don't know. Uh, I went to the door, and there was the package. 
So this uh, 24 hour uh, fulfillment thing is, is starting to happen. I, I've never seen anything like it. Oh, it, it is absolutely in motion. It's an area I've been tracking for a year or two. There are some serious uh, social implications of this. Mm. Um, and there's a lot of consumer demand and a lot of competition. I mean, it, it, uh, uh, it's, it's a huge topic. It's a huge topic. Yeah, I mean, uh, this, this drone thing, of course, uh, you know, the secret is, is that you have to wear earmuffs to avoid, uh, you know, the machine noise. But it, it, it's really going to start happening a lot I, quicker I than we the, realize. The drone thing captures headlines and it sort of embodies, uh, it, it helps people visualize how fast and autonomous this stuff can be. But for the next few years, and it's already happening now, um, the way I describe it is somebody will deliver something to your door because they don't have another job to do that. A company like Google will go dip into their pockets to bring you something to win your business. Uh, or, or you'll go to a central location like a 7-Eleven or a Citibank, and you'll have a locker. So those are the buffer box, Amazon lockers, um, other things like this. Right, and you see this with uh, you know Uber expand expanding into delivery, and uh, you know basically when I, I say drones are going to come quicker than we realize, it's because you know effectively the job description of drone driver could be any of us if you know if we're on the corner of x and x uh and there's this thing that you walk walks by and throws it into the back of your wind uh your car window because they know that you're going to once you get out of this traffic jam you're going to be right where you can you know hand it off to another drone uh, we're going to be the drones not the not the machines yeah i mean this just reminds me i think i watched a documentary somewhere about people who were engaged in, you know, engaged in war on behalf of the U.S., but were, you know, in the middle of Kansas, right? Um, so th this stuff will come, I agree with you. I think in the next two to three years, or what we're seeing now, is where a lot of money is changing hands and a lot of consumer behavior is shifting. So that that's just <laughs> an area that I, that I focus on or have a personal interest in. Is that noise somebody getting a notification that's rattling on their desk? I just want to know before yeah, I go it's me. Totally it's insane. me. It's me. My phone buzzed. That's all right. Just, just make another proof point of the notification economy uh, in full swing. Dan Farber, what, any uh, any comments on uh, this thread that we're on? Well, I, I might go back to another thread where we're talking about enterprise companies uh, or this kind of intersection of enterprise and consumer. And I think a very good example of that would be LinkedIn, which today announced that it reached uh, 300 million people on its, on its service and that they have acquired 23 million new users since the beginning of the year and that they're after the 3.3 billion workers in the world to be on their service. So that, that's a very interesting story and uh, and a slice that, you know, they've built a very big moat around that. Uh, Kevin, I, I've been trying to avoid asking you this, but what is a frag mention? Um, so frag mention was an idea that I came up with with a bunch of IndieWare people this week. Um, and I'll give you a bit of context. So the, the, the problem is you can link to a page, um, but you can't link to a piece of a page at the moment unless someone's put an ID in the page to let you link to that. Um, and what we realized is that the best way to actually link to something now is to, is to quote a piece of it. So if you want to find something, you don't, you don't try and find a link to it. You search Google for a quote from it, and then you can find um, wherever the various copies of it are. So applying that same thing to an individual page what you do is you link um, to the page and then uh, instead of putting a hash and an ID number you put two hashes and some words and then the browser um, looks for those words in the page and highlights the paragraph those words are in. So that, that was the, the idea was to let you link to smaller pieces of content um, and we put this together as a like a working prototype um, this week and have been experimenting with it um, and I think it's got a lot of potential for um, well, it also gets to the whole deep linking. It gets to the deep linking uh, question that we were 
been talking yeah. about for the last few shows. So it's, it's, it lets you deep link in, into into text across the web um, to to like a smaller granularity than than you could before. But it requires a bit of cooperation either from the receiving site or by modifying the browser. And we've got both those versions up and working, so you can experiment with it. Um, but the other point of it is that it would enable you to do um, the kind of per paragraph comments that Medium does, um, but doing that across sites. So I could write a comment on one paragraph of your blog post or, or, or whatever. So that was the um, that that was that's what I've been like thinking about and messing around with uh, the last few days. I've also been you know just on this show in particular because we're experimenting with some different camera positions. Uh, I've been trying to avoid the fact that I'm old, bald, and fat. Uh, in in terms of the various shots, uh, and as a result, I've been uh, starting to realize that, and this does relate to uh, what you just said. Uh, I started to realize that what I really want is uh, loading up on the lock screen of the information that I'm looking at. If the chat room was on the lock screen, then I wouldn't have to keep showing people what my secret five uh, number code is uh, to get into this thing because there is no switch on the iPad to be able to leave it on. It just shuts off automatically and there is no <coughs> setting that I'm aware of. Well, a couple of things, Steve. So one, I do believe in setting somewhere buried unless through iOS 7 and their flat design, they removed it. I think you can keep the brightness on and remove remove the locking if it's plugged in. Um, really? I think that that's in there. Um, I'll uh, also check and email okay, you. Okay, that'll be excellent. Yeah, but the second but thing, my point, though, uh, uh, hold the thought. Yeah. Uh, my point about the uh, the lock hey, screen Steve. capability. <laughs> oh, yeah. i got to jump off in like two minutes. I'm so sorry. Okay, well, thanks for, thanks for joining us. Can you come back <laughs> soon? Danny? I sorry you cut out. Can you come back soon? I come back the next call. <laughs> Very good. Talk to you then. All right. Take See care. Bye bye. Nice talk with you guys. Um, bye. And here's the lock screen thing, Steve. What are you showing us? Uh, where to set the thing so it never turns off. You never. put never. Just choose never. <laughs> Auto lock. That's not what we're talking about. No, it is. It is. If you choose never, whatever screen you're on will just stay there. It'll, it won't go dark. It's not a it screen. It won't go center. dark. It won't go dark. Unbelievable. Okay. So the second thing, Steve, that you mentioned was around presenting the mobile or tablet user uh, with with different types of information on the lock screen that makes it easier to go into the app. Is that what you were talking about? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm trying okay. to get at. So the interesting things there are if you if you now this is only happening on the Android ecosystem. Um, although oh, well, that's I, why I don't care. Oh. Go ahead. I'm <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it really quick. So you have cover screen, uh, which was just acquired by Twitter. Um, then the next battleground is you have new home screen or launchers. So there's Aviate, which was acquired by Yahoo. Uh, there's another one called Agent. Um, I really I use all of them. I have an Android device separately to test a lot of apps, and uh, we're betaing swell on it right now. Um, the on cover screen was really interesting because they used different signals on the phone, different sensors, to create this sort of unique uh, fingerprint for for me as the user, and they would try to predict what are the four or five apps I'd want to open, and then I would just sort of tap and slide over the icon. And so what I liked about it is it rewarded true engagement, not where the app rested on my phone or whether somebody um, bothered me with a slew of push notifications. It just sort of said, oh, it's 8 a.m. Samil might be driving in his car. Here are the four or five apps he may use. Or, hey, it's 2.30. He just picked up the phone and the accelerometer went up. He may be going out for coffee, mm -hmm. so he might want to text or call his wife. Um, and that kind of innovation that's a, a possible – you know, UI innovation that's possible on Android right now um, makes those devices pretty cool. Like, I, I really enjoy that. Um, I was very impressed specifically with Cover. Um, now, a lot of people think that at some point as Google reigns in Android, there's no way in hell that they would ever allow um, somebody else to, to take that screen. But right now, it's, it's definitely possible.
So I'm trying to tie these, uh, what Kevin was saying together with what you just said and what I'm saying, which is that uh, push notifications on both platforms are is the new operating system. It is not going to happen big time uh, and it's not going to influence software and app development unless it's available on both platforms. That's number one. Number two, there will be... Uh, you can use the notification stream to alert people to these kinds of things. So, you know, the problem with FriendFeed, other than that it's been dead for four years, is that it doesn't give us an encapsulated stream of, you know, last in on the on the top of the screen like many other things do. If we were just listening to tweets, uh, they all come in at the top of the notification screen for me. So I can monitor the chat room if the software emulates it. Uh, the lock screen scenario, that's uh, an opportunity for software developers, which I think is going to be very big. There's, there's an issue with that in practice, unfortunately, today, which is on the iOS side. Um, I'm a big Apple fan. All Apple products, except for this side Android phone that I use, um, they've kind of just opened the floodgates for notifications, and there's no governor against it, and it's kind of a ruined channel, in my opinion. Uh, I, I couldn't agree with you more, but the good actors are going to win this war, and those that can figure out how to be able to prioritize notifications on behalf of the user uh, inside an app that is commonly used are going to win this game. So, so a couple of interesting things. There's an uh, there's a company that I used to work for called Ift. If this, then that. Mm -hmm. um, that's part of their long term vision inside the app. Again, they're they're in a container, uh, but they they have the architecture to do it. Uh, the other, second point I was going to make is on Android. Um, there's a lot more interactions available on on a push notification, and so you it enables the developer to be a little more creative. It gives more control to the user. And I do believe that Apple will be pushed in a direction to allow the developer, as you're suggesting, Steve, to be more creative and more thoughtful about what those push notifications are. Absolutely. I think that you know they basically borrowed notifications from Android and improved on it. Uh, and although we certainly have uh, gang members who will disagree with this, like the one over there with the uh, bass net behind him or whatever that thing is, the... I think it looks like a hat, by the way, uh, Kevin. Uh, in spite of that, uh, you know, bias toward uh, Android, you know, notifications have now started to be, because of the more open platform, have started to become uh, a grounds for innovation. However, uh, you know, in the iPad market, which is where this is really an issue, Francine Hardaway is talking about this. Uh, in the uh, in the chat room, she's complaining about FriendFeed, but there is no app that does what FriendFeed does in terms of real time. I mean, basically, what happened was is that the two principles of FriendFeed were acquired, aqua hired away from doing any more innovation because they had been working so rapidly uh, in in fundamentally creating this kind of feedback loop. Uh, that is so powerful that it's not a question of uh, getting off of FriendFeed. It's a question of finding anybody else or anything that is adapted to uh, the mobile environment that can emulate it. And uh, my point is, is that the iPad environment is what? 75, 85% of all uh, tablets? So that's the target for what I'm talking about here. It's not so the phone. So for one, you know, if, if there are people out there um, that share Steve's pain around this, and I would imagine that there are, now this is a power use case, but what a user could do tactically in this scenario is you take your iPad, you go and you shut off every notification, every single one, maybe you leave open SMS for, you know, family and stuff like that. You go download Ift, and then on the web, because it's a lot easier on the web, you set up you set up your own kind of friend feed trigger system, right? And then from that point, you can let Ift control your notification stream. And that would give the user complete 110% control. 
Yeah, I don't think it's as draconian as having to shut off everything. I already shut off everything that it, that disabuses the uh, uh, you know the uh, notification stream. Uh, and you know, as far as for example, in this scenario, when we're on the air, uh, it's very very active. It's hard to keep up with. It's not. Yeah. Hard, it's hard to keep up with this Leo's chat. It, it's. It's very quick, but when we're off the air, maybe there'll be a couple of comments at the end of the show, and that's it for the until the next week or until the next uh, broadcast. So, so I, I have a theory about this around push. I actually think it is the tech types like all of us and the early adopters like all of us that get annoyed by push notifications that want to go in and have that precise level of control. Mm -hmm. What the data shows from some of the new apps that offer you know, always on location or, you know, flood you with notifications. I think there are two things going on. One is consumers are just kind of hitting that button more and more and more. Um, and secondly, I my, my theory, there's no way to prove this, is that it's more attitudinal. So that, um, you know, take the next 25-year-old uh, first-time Snapchat user. Um, if they were to get, uh, you know, 30 emails a day, notification emails about activity on Snapchat, they would view that as spam unsubscribe block that account on on mobile it's just kind of a throwaway message you either see it in the moment or it's gone and there's no cost there's no weight to those messages so I think there's there's this uh, early adopter slash mainstream divide and I think there's this um, partially generational divide between saying yeah I don't care if your app sends me you know 50 update you know 50 push notifications I just We'll ignore it and just wait for one that captures my attention. Yeah, I, I think it's partly what you just said, and I think it's also uh, going to increasingly be governed by third parties that come in and use this to be able to establish credibility and uh, and authority in the notification area. And the, the you know that the problem of glut is really ephemeral for the second reason that you just mentioned, which is that. Uh, people will use this as a, uh, you know, as something that they're sort of getting a zeitgeist feel about, and not really caring about the individual. I mean, I do that with Twitter. Uh, I've got 150 or or so people uh, that uh, hit the notification window. It, it's death to the battery, but on the other hand, uh, that's why Mofi exists. So you you start to be able to compensate for it the major developers, the platform uh, folks, start to understand that if they let it go completely, they're going to lose their audience. And there's the tension and pull, push and pull from uh, uh, Google versus uh, Apple uh, that's you know keeping these people honest. But, you know, in the case of Apple, you know, like, for example... There's no reason why you, Steve, shouldn't have a ability to go into iOS right now and hit, quote, presentation mode so that your notifications um, are, are put in a different container while you're doing the show, right? If you Or you wanted to make a presentation at work um, and you didn't want to have all those things pop in, you can't really do that now. So it's not, even that very simple use case is not. No, but you can't do it with their app, but you can do it with an app that you control, which then can feed it into their engine. And I mean, that's what Chatter does. So that's what uh, you know. Salesforce what, One pushes things in, directly into the into both their own internal buffer and also the uh, uh, you know the notification stream. So these things, I I, I recognize what you're saying, and I think that you're uh, completely right about where this is going to go. Android's openness is going to push Apple to productize this. There are going to be, in particularly in the marketing uh, roll-up, you're going to see this kind of thing. It's like the window for uh, uh, on-demand is is moving from uh, real-time plus three to real-time plus seven. These things don't happen immediately, but they happen pretty quickly in the larger scheme of things. And I think that we're going to start to see this. This is why I think that the GNIP uh, investment is a major threshold for people starting to pay attention to this. 
because it, it, they're essentially saying, I mean, you know, Twitter never does anything except to choke off uh, everybody else in the marketplace and then use that to establish a value proposition for the, their stream of data. And I think that's what they're doing here. I don't think that it's an aqua hire at all. Okay. Uh, Dan Farber, you want to, uh, anything else you want to talk about or do you want to summarize? Uh, I'd rather summarize this when I, I need to get something to eat before I get too angry. Uh, it's be a Zen kind of angry? Yes, absolutely. Okay, we, I'd like to see that. I need some instruction. Okay, well, I'll provide it for you next week. Oh, so you're not going to summarize? Either? Well, the, sum the summarize I would have would be more of a look forward. There's lots of earnings next week, so it should be a fun week to see how these big companies are doing and how the uh, IPO market is looking. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Keith? Uh, interesting set of questions this week. They all speak to big trends that are going to be dominating our thinking for the next 12 months. So I, I thought it was a good show and lots of food for thought. Kevin? I'm going to. So I'm still thinking about this uh, fragmentation stuff and how we can um, build things that connect together without um, everyone having to be in the same app. So that's that's where my brain is this week. Well, I, and I say to you, fragmentation into the lock screen. Thank you very much. Next <laughs> week, I can talk about an answer to that question. Oh well, that well, that would be good too. Uh, and finally, Samil. Um, let's see. I guess what I'm. What I'd like to just propose for the next time I'm on the show, I won't be here next week, um, and I, I have a ton of fun on here, is uh, maybe let's kick it off just talking about what some of the early stage startups are doing that are interesting to people, and, and maybe that'll bleed into the larger larger players, so we start like a more bottoms-up approach. Okay. Uh, speaking of next week, we're it's not clear whether we're going to go dark next week, or we may move to uh, a notification model and... Uh, <laughs> So I'll have some uh, news about that uh, as to how uh, people, particularly in the uh, chat room, can uh, uh, reach us via notification so that they are then aware of uh, our broadcast schedule. So uh, we'll be in touch about that. I want to thank uh, Salesforce.com for their support for this show. Also, uh, Ustream for their support. Uh, and uh, huge... Uh, kudos to uh, uh, New Tech and their incredible TriCaster, uh, without which the show would just frankly not be possible. And I, I think you'll realize when, as you uh, sample, uh, uh, Samil, I believe, had a, uh, uh, a self serving uh, tweet uh, an hour ago about a company called Swell. I think that's, uh, I think you have something to do with that, if I'm reading your chest correctly. Yes. Yeah. Um, uh, about this mul multiplicity of uh, podcasts, uh, tech podcasts that are yep. mushrooming and uh, further tweets about uh, the iPhone's incredible microphone uh, uh, making that more and more possible. So we're getting a lot of competition, but uh, it, more is the better. Uh, I retweeted that post, but not because I want to promote uh, anybody except you, Samil, but uh, because uh, there's just... Uh, an incredible uh, opportunity that's been that's broken out in the uh, audio space and uh, so the video space has to provide value uh, emotionally and otherwise uh, that makes this an experience that that you're not going to want to miss uh, I want to thank our producer and director Tina Chase Gilmore I want to thank uh, Dan Farber Go forth and eat, sir. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank Keith Tier. No, I ate just before the show, so I'm good. That makes me good. Uh, and uh, Kevin Marks, the incredible... Uh, go ahead. I, I definitely need to go and eat something now, yeah. Okay. Otherwise, I'm going to be falling asleep in the sun. Uh, Samuel Shaw, you've been Super fantastic. Well. As far as I'm concerned, you can be on any show you want to be. Awesome. And... Uh, uh, and I've said that to you already, so. Great. Uh, I still mean it. And uh, Danny Sullivan, 
<laughs> it's great to have you here, and uh, I look forward to actually talking to you as opposed to your screen. Uh, thanks to the chat room, as always. We'll try and make it better for you, Francine. Uh, and uh, we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.